-hmm. none of which happens in the typical justice system. Right. Right. Exactly. The victim can be left just as broken yes. mm -hmm. or needy in the typical justice system yes. as they were before. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Jackie, can you pursue that community? How does a community heal? What is that what does that mean? How does the community heal? Well, you know, in restorative justice, um, there's a belief that the, that the whole community is harmed when a crime is committed. So if your house is broken into, your neighbor is affected by that mm -hmm. because now they're afraid mm -hmm. that their house is going to get broken into. So an when you, our, the kids need to understand that they're not only affecting that person whose home they broke into, but they've affected everyone. So we, in, in um, the community justice program, what we do is we have community members, people that are from all different walks of the community. Uh, we have pastors, we have um, community uh, resource people, we have former parents, parents whose kids have actually been in the program and come back and volunteer with us so that they can sit in on the conferences and represent the community itself. And um, it has a lot to do with competency development. And you alluded mm -hmm. to that when, when people come, people eventually have to come out. They have to come out of these programs. Mm -hmm. They have to come out of, of prisons and things like that. And, and a big part of um, restorative justice is developing those competencies so that when that person is finished with this program, they're then able to move forward and be reintegrated into the community. One of the things that I like that I've seen is the the volunteering aspect, the community service. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know a protective factor is uh, connection to your mm -hmm. community. It's harder to victimize someone that you're connected to, mm -hmm. at, whether that be a place or a person. Uh, so talk about the different kinds of community service activities that you do uh, with the young people. I know I just saw some of your young people at the back to school extravaganza, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was really nice. but. There's many other things that you all do uh, for them to give back. Well, like one of the things that we have done is to feed the homeless. Uh, we've been real big on that. Uh, see that, see those who are less fortunate than you are. Mm. And sometimes you will be, you know, what people don't realize, sometimes our kids take great pride in that. Because they realize if I stay on this track, I could be one step away from being in that position. But most mm. importantly, I get to make a proud choice. So you start talking about community buy-in. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Start talking about self-buy-in. I'm, I'm, I'm buying into the system. And collectively, as we all buy into the system, right, our kids are able to give more. So just not feeding the homeless, but, right. you know, just connecting. last week, yeah. right, connecting, mm -hmm. like saying, hey, I understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, it's, it's, and we all want to feel like someone understands some of the decisions we have made. Mm -hmm. And it's very important. Uh, that the empathy is going to be developed right. and that's why restorative justice mm -hmm. help us with the community yeah. services right. of restoring the community because when when you have the type of uh, what can I say inclination maybe try to be a delinquent or, or being a delinquent empathy is not there for others mm -hmm. so what it happens with restorative justice and the community services and the healing processes uh, is like a is, is developed if, if I did run to you, Cindy, for example, and I do not take responsibility of my actions, it's very difficult for me to be able to understand that I need to do something right to uh, come back and restore you or to make it right to you. Mm -hmm. So restorative justice helps us with that. It's not only that, oh, you did run and go to restorative justice and that's it. No, what needs are and how can I, the one who did the transgression, to provide for you to do better, and as well the community, feeding the wholeness. Also, for example, if the victim has a need, it's a bike for another kid that has been stolen, for example, that is sometimes typical between among juveniles. What can I do for that child? Well, maybe I'm better in math, so I can help with math. So things that can be really, um, given to that person that I re did run to it. Mm -hmm. And I know that you do a lot also of the community services when the community has been already harmed with petty theft, that we see those cases right. over and over. I don't know really how the stores, and I see that you also mm -hmm. see those. You know, what's interesting that one of the things we recently did with one of our 
recently have done with one of our students that graduated from the program. Uh, we took him inside of a store, a business owner, mm -hmm. and we took the opportunity to sit down the business owner, uh, sit down the business owner as well as him. And I allowed the business owner to break down his margins and profits, right? Yeah. And what happens yeah, when someone steals, how mm -hmm. that affects his business, but not only his business, but his family. And you show this child the chain effect and then you ask the child, right? Because here's where the, the accountability comes in. Mm -hmm. If I own my own business, would I want someone to steal from me? And how would that hurt my family? Mm -hmm. See, sometimes, and this goes back to the healing, it goes back to the community buy-in. Mm -hmm. If I don't understand the logic about this, some of the decisions I'm making, right? If I can't see, if I can't touch it, then it's not real to me. But when you break down the math, I always I call it doing the math with my students. <laughs> I say, but when you do the math, you see how this just not affect the person you you may have commit this petty theft mm -hmm. from, but you see how it affects the family as well, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. someone is trying to feed their family the honest way, and you're taking mm -hmm. that. And, and I don't want whoever may be watching this to take this away. I really want whoever's watching this to take this away that we don't only uh, do the restorative justice piece, but then the child receives psychoeducational anger management. You have the nurturing parenting, mm -hmm. you know, on top of the uh, community service learning. This, the child mm -hmm. is actually yeah. being set up right. with services. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So we're just not releasing them because, you know, when they go in the detention center, there's a, there's, there's, this intense services is not taking place. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. So this is something critical for us to mention. Mm -hmm. I think some of these um, offenders or perpetrators or the children who commit transgressions, whatever you mm -hmm. want to call them, have often been victimized themselves. Right. Absolutely. Very true. This, there's a lot this of trauma. There's a lot so of trauma come there. Come out of nowhere, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing with the trauma then. Yeah. So you can help do that. Another thing that I wanted to make sure that we, we got in before we ended, you know, you talked about the conference, um, the Restorative Justice Conference, and, and one of the things, one of the, the portions of it was on uh, mass incarceration in America yeah. and the disproportionality of that. Um, and it starts in the juvenile level it starts actually at the school level mm -hmm. um, right. often and there's the jail school to jail pipeline that gets talked about how misconduct at school has mm -hmm. you know become criminalized and so mm -hmm. it it hurries many kids in there and um, just like across the nation this is happening more to young black men than to any other group for example in Broward County um, when you look at the, the youth population, 10 to 17 years of age, black, um, black youth are 35% of that. When you look at the delinquency referrals, they're 68% yes. of, mm -hmm. you know, so they're getting arrested more often. They're being invited into our juvenile justice system on a regular basis. So these front end solutions, the civil citation, the diversion, are creating front-end solutions that kind of move them back out in a healthy way, back mm -hmm. in, into society, so that they're not just, you know, getting deeper and deeper into juvenile justice and winding up being another statistic of mass incarceration. So I think that's another value that, that this kind of handling of crime helps with. And also help the parents. In our program in Harmony, we um, create do family confidencing. So the parents is a ha, a ha moment when they see that they are not responsible anymore for the behavior mm -hmm. sometimes of the child. Like you were saying before, it's, it's the responsibility of their own child to make their own amendments. And this is what we are promoting. The parents are there. We mm -hmm. engage the parents even more into the program. The parents learn what, what means to, to really be able to see, okay, now is my time to see that you are complying with some of the uh, homeworks or, or some of the, the things that you need to do to really restore, the, to uh, able to heal me and to heal the community that you already did something wrong to it. Mm -hmm. It's not my responsibility at this time, it's yours. Mm -hmm. So we really are helping them and helping the parents understand how they need to work together and cooperate into do good for the whole community. Mm 
Yeah, absolutely. The, the parent group component is a very important part of our programs because there, the parents have the opportunity to not just learn some new skills and techniques and things on, you know, how to work with their kids, but they get to talk to each other. Mm. And they form little communities. Mm -hmm. And they can, they, each, yes, yes, and they're able to support each other mm -hmm. through this because, you know, for many, many of them, for the vast majority of them, they've never had any contact with the, the justice system. They don't know what's going on. They're very confused about everything. Mm -hmm and it really gives them a good outlet. Mm. And yeah, I think that's interesting that you say that many have had no contact with, because I think the perception probably out there is that that's, this is intergenerational. It's just going, the crime just keeps oh. coming down. No, not really. No, it, it, not really. And it troubled me that sometimes people think this mm -hmm. way. Yeah, it's that's true. why I and, want to get it clear. And, and, and here's the thing, I am, you know, a second generation American, you know, Haitian American. You know, my parents migrated here from Haiti and you know they work with nothing they work their way up you know God is moving my, my older brother made some bad decisions I got a brother doing 35 years in prison okay that's just being honest it's not a you no know, one child do it another child no because I went to Iowa State University and got my master's degree I went to the University of Duke and got my undergrad degree in criminal justice so I have understand that it's all about the decision and chances we are given. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my brother, it was, a, it was a, a multiple thing for him. No one ever restored him. No one ever made him understand, mm -hmm. right? When you have parents who have migrated, they work in two jobs apiece. Mm -hmm. So they're barely home. So I learned from the mistakes they have made. Mm -hmm. But now, they, we are given the opportunity to change other kids' lives. My brother actually gets on the phone and talks to some kids who make poor decisions and tell them, listen, prison life is not what you want. Mm -hmm. So we have to look deeper. It, you know, here's the thing, restorative justice bring on for forgiveness, okay? We all have been forgiving for something. Yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's right. We all have been forgiven for something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know no one who's 100% a, who's a perfect. <laughs> Even if well, you I am. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we all have been forgiven. And yeah. so all we're saying, our justice, we got to understand, these are kids. We are, right. we are expecting kids who are 10, 11, and 12 to operate as if they're 30, right. they're 40, and they're 50. And never make mistakes. And never make mistakes. When everybody makes mistakes. When them. everybody right. makes them. So we have to understand, this is not a generational thing. The bus do stops. And that, unfortunately, this show is not infinite either, and I'm going to have to stop us there. Already? <laughs> but it was a great place to stop. We're not ready. <laughs> With all our imperfections and all our ability to ask for forgiveness ourselves, I still think we all can agree that the ultimate goal is for everyone to live in safer communities and supportive communities. One way that we can do that is to identify ways in which young people can develop a clear, positive vision of their future. Investing in programs that emphasize restitution, communication, conflict resolution, and most importantly, alternatives to incarceration, well, maybe not most importantly, but that's an important piece, <laughs> can bring a much higher return on investment than funding more detention facilities and prison beds. Yes. yes. I want to thank Michelange Obel, Miriam Campbell Goldman, Jacqueline Lashbrook, and Audrey Stang for their work towards these efforts. I've been your host, Cindy Arenberg seltzer President and CEO of the Children's Services Council of Broward County, where our mission is to empower Broward's children to become responsible, productive adults, capable of realizing their full potential, their hopes, and their dreams. For copies of this program or any other episode of Future First, please call the Children's Services Council at 954-377-1000 or visit www.cscbroward.org, like us on Facebook, and remember to join us next time on Future First, Focus on Broward's Children. Mm -hmm.